There is no such thing as journalistic objectivity when it comes to how I feel and what I've learned from the incredible and essential Jane Wagner. Any one of us could do worse than growing up under the influence of this American genius, born and partly raised in Tennessee, a place you can still hear in her beautiful deep voice, a place she will never let go of because it is where her life as a storyteller began. And like so many tremendous artists, it's Jane's fundamental Americanness that translates so gorgeously to the screen and stage and on the page. I can see where I was when I saw JT, Jane's first produced teleplay. I was a boy myself then, no older than the protagonist. And watching the show was like looking into my soul because for the first time I saw what I had been missing all along. A character who lived and breathed the life I had been living in Brooklyn long before there was anything like busing or urban renewal or equal opportunity, anything. I made a mental note of the writer's name as the credits rolled at the end of JT, and I never forgot it. And when I saw her name again, attached to movies like The Incredible Shrinking Woman and Appearing Nightly and special starring her wife, Lily Tomlin, I was so happy because I got to thrill to Jane's incredible versatility and her humanness and it's there in classic pieces like Juke and Opal and Seven Free Women, work that is like no other in its understanding of how we become ourselves with a little help sometimes from love. I love Jane more than I can say for many reasons, including her helping to give voice to Lily's depiction of humanity and for JT and for Trudy and for Rick and for the many, many people she has populated our world with through the uniqueness of her vision and care and humor and perspective, which is like no other. I'll say it again, I love Jane Wagner. And if you don't, you will, because she is irreplaceable and that rare thing in today's world, a humanist who knows that we're all entering life's vast playing field entirely and happily and confusingly and with love from left field. Hello and welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us in this celebration of Jane Wagner, this year's winner of the Lambda Literary Visionary Award. I'm Amy Shoulder, president of the Lambda Literary Board of Directors, and it is my great honor to bring you a conversation between Jane Wagner, Lily Tomlin, and Hilton Alls. Every year, Lambda's board bestows a special honor to a member of our community who, through their achievement and passionate commitment to writing, have contributed meaningfully to LGBTQ culture. This year, the board was unanimous in its decision to celebrate a true cultural icon, Jane Wagner, with the Lambda Literary Visionary Award. One of America's most distinguished playwrights, Jane won a New York Drama Critics Circle Special Award and a New York Drama Desk Award for her Broadway success, The Search for Signs of Intelligent Life in the Universe. Jane has three Grammy nominations for comedy albums she wrote with Lily Tomlin and two Peabody Awards, the first for the CBS television special JT and the second for the ABC television special Edith Ann's Christmas, Just Say Noel. Jane's innovative and barrier-breaking work has helped influence and shape the lives of generations of young LGBTQ writers. Her work defies both categorization and reflects the broad range of our shared humanity. During the pandemic, Jane's character of Trudy, the unhoused woman whose umbrella hat channels the lives of the play's characters, strikes us as especially timeless and profound. Consider when she says, I made some studies and reality is the leading cause of stress amongst those in touch with it. Lambda Literary is not the first to call Jane Wagner a visionary, but we are incredibly proud to honor her with this award for her incredible and extraordinary career. Congratulations, Jane, on being this year's recipient of the Lambda Literary Visionary Award. Before I turn things over to Hilton to further discuss Jane's work, allow me to introduce our other speakers today Hilton Alls became a staff writer at The New Yorker in 1994 and a theater critic in 2002. His gorgeous book, White Girls, was a finalist for the National Book Critics Circle Award in 2014. 
a beautiful voice in our community. Hilton's work is in so many ways, it chronicles the most pressing issues of our cultural lives. And the phenomenal performer Lily Tomlin has received numerous awards, including seven Emmys, a Tony for her one woman Broadway show appearing nightly, a second Tony for best actress, a drama desk award for her one woman performance in her wife, Jane Wagner's, the search for signs of intelligent life in the universe. I, by the way, have my copy of the first edition, which I bought when it was first published in 1986. Um, Lily uh, can currently be seen in the hit Netflix show, Grace and Frankie. Um, it's such a thrill and honor to be among uh, you all. Um, and it's my pleasure to bring up Hilton Alls. Hi, Amy. Hey, Jane. It is such an extraordinary privilege for me to be here with, um, with a woman um, who has probably had one of the more profound effects on my, my life and my writing. Jane, like the great poet Marion Moore, is not really just a poet or a playwright. She is a philosopher. And the extraordinary work that she has done to broaden the ways in which we think and feel, articulating that has been one of the great journeys of my life, charting um, her work from JT um, onward. Um, you can never, mm -hmm. never mistake anyone else's sentences for a Jane Wagner sentence. Um, and that is because the bedrock of it is, is thinking. So I'm honored to be here and to ask Jane a few questions. Jane is an extraordinarily private, funny person. I won't drag her through, <laughs> through too many questions. Um, a lot of her thinking and feeling is in her writing, and I love her for that. So, um, Jane, I want to ask you a few questions just because it's an opportunity for us to talk about how much you mean to, to us, um, not only as a community, but as a community of thinkers. And um, your writing is so beautiful on so many levels. And one thing that stands out for me constantly is the effect it has on the ear, on the listener's ear. Your, your character's voices are profound and real. Um, and I know you're from the South and I, I know that there's a great tradition of storytelling and fibbing um, in the South. And I just wanted to know what was it like for you growing up in Tennessee and what did you feel retrospectively about your life there? The South itself like hacks into your DNA, yeah. and you become so um, so southern in in culture and and my love for the South. I still I still have it so much. How did you make your way to New York? By bus. By bus. <laughs> <laughs> you didn't ask me how I got to New York. Roller skating. <laughs> <laughs> you're, you're kidding. As a contest or something? Yeah. I was like Jane Fonda and they shoot horses, don't they? You know? Oh, I just kind of um, did ballroom dancing across the bridge until I got here. Oh, God. Um, well, I was a, you know, Southern girl and there was a place in New York that you could stay at the Y for $10 a week and get yeah. breakfast and the newspaper. So, um... So I went there. I had a little bit of money from being on tour with the Barter Theater. What was the name of the theater? Barter Theater. Barter Theater, uh-huh. I'd like to mention it because it was really important for me. Um, Colleen Dewhurst. Yes. Um, wonderful people. Played. And I did, um, I did Laura. I was an actress first before trying writing because when I read... Carson McCullers and Eudora Welty and all, all beautiful Southern writers. I didn't think there was anything for me to say. If I became a writer, what was I going to say? Because they'd said it all, I felt. You know. And only when I went to New York that I got out of that feeling. Um, I used to get a lump in my throat. Mm -hmm. And so much so that I actually thought I might have a goiter. <laughs> As a teenager, my mother was a 
duplicate bridge player, and she had partners, and they all had goiters. It was quite a, you know, a big, big thing. My mother had just a double chin, but the other partners <laughs> had uh, goiters, and I saw I was kind of fixed on that. Was that what was the lump in my throat? Because yeah. I read, you know, Faulkner didn't do it. But there were certain writers that just, and the South itself made me feel that way. But did the, you like Capote's writing? Oh, I did like that. Yeah, I did. I don't, I don't remember at what point I was, you know, introduced to certain writers. I just remember the sweeping thing that I had about the South that was haunting to me. And um, at some point I realized I wasn't going to get a goiter or I didn't have a thyroid problem because <laughs> the lump in my throat was really my heart it was your, and it was your home it was your home yeah, it was a, and and it was there but it was my heart i all felt i remember having that perception about because at one point um they had to carry me out of lassie comes home so i cried easily as a child you know the movie it was really sad anyway, but but it wasn't the same thing as getting the lump in your throat that those writers gave me. There's something haunting and so Southern and yeah. so uh, so neurotic about a lot of those characters. <laughs> I mean, I had I had almost all those characters represented in my family. Really? <laughs> I had great, great aunts and uncles, and I just, they were very, very meaningful to me. Um, and... And very supportive. Um, I had two great uncles my, who were gay, mm -hmm. and they were so influential. I was asked when I was 12 to go and live with them and take care of their mother, who was in her 90s. Mm -hmm. And she still had Gone with the Wind by her bed. <laughs> that sounded ancient, but that was her. She was, was in her 90s, uh, and I'm approaching my 90s. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, I felt like um, I had had the world just opened up to me when I, I went from just a little apartment where we um, were just hated to this wonderful Victorian house where Howard Moore and my gay uncles lived. And it was just an incredible experience. They were fantastic people. They'd been to New York, which meant everything to me. In fact, they'd gone to New York and uh, actually had done some plays there. I don't know how, because they were sons of a, a Methodist preacher. And wow. so I, you, I guess New York did that to them, that they got into show business. And uh, I, I remember they were alcoholic, too. And they, <laughs> but I loved the fact I had, they kind of, we kind of avoided each other when I was living there, but at night they would start getting um, drunk on white and light, and, and uh, yes. they were just so entertaining and just so much fun. You know, um, Warren loved Bessie Smith, that's yeah. and I was introduced to a whole world of culture, and the house had books. I, I only read magazines until then, and then when I, and I was 12 years old, and I can remember some of the things I read um, it seemed odd for a Methodist preacher to have in, <laughs> in his house, so I must, maybe it was from Howard Warren, but I read Guy de Maupassant, yeah. learned about short stories, yes. and, um, and um, Edgar Allan Poe, yeah. and I think I read, I think I read, uh, Emerson, maybe, and Thoreau, and it was just an incredible thing to have books. I never saw Howard Warren read a book at all, but there were books there. And yeah. I remember at some point when I was a teenager, I, um, I found a book It was called um, The World as I See It, mm -hmm. and it was by Einstein. Mm -hmm. And I always read things where books fall open from the concept. That's how I got educated. Whatever was there, I would read, even though I had no background. Mm -hmm. No, like when I read Einstein, I, I had no background in science, but I remember the first thing that I remember, remember reading from, from Einstein, and he said, um, gravity 
was the cause of falling. And I remember thinking in my head, and old age. <laughs> yes. and, and I was kind of an awareness that I could take something and play off it. Yes. In, in, uh, in the search and really in a lot of things, I just would take something that was said and twist it or make something became sort of a style without my realizing it. But yes. Howard, Howard and Warren were so influential. Well, I had my Aunt Flo and Melcy, they were, and Anna. Um, they were influential too, but in a different way. I didn't think I'm looking back. I don't think I bonded with my mother enough, and I, but I did bond with my aunts and um, my great, my grandmother, not my great grandmother, but I didn't particularly like my great grandmother. She would give us candy when it had kind of turned white, mm -hmm. and, you know, and we didn't think that was a good thing for her to do. So I ate it anyway. But, uh, but my job when I went to the big house, it was called. It actually was called the big house. It was a wonderful Victorian house. And that's where Howard and Warren lived. And I knew my job was to take the tray up to Danny, you know. Mm -hmm. And I still have some guilt about the fact that I ate off her tray. <laughs> I mean, if there, if there was like um, a wonderful dessert, uh, I didn't think sugar even there. I didn't think it would be good for her to eat too much sugar. So <laughs> even, if, even though I wasn't that aware of nutrition, I didn't feel that guilty. But when she died, I felt guilty because I had eaten off her tray. And um, I'm sure she forgave you. Oh, I don't think so. Not Danny. She was. <laughs> She was, she seemed bitter, and she was not like my, my uh, grandmother, Mama Dear, we called her. She mm. was fantastic. And it's only lately that I began to think that maybe she was, she was um, on morphine, because she, the whole time I knew her, she was sick in bed, basically, wow. and with cancer. And it was my job there to bring her tray. And so it's a wonder I don't fear age a lot because that bringing the tray, you get to feel these are people that just are very, very sick. And But I love my grandmother and um, Mama Dear. She seemed to really love me. And at four, she died. And I think I still have post-traumatic syndrome from her death because I was sent away. I loved her so much that they didn't want me to be there, that it, they didn't know how I was, I was going to react. And so they sent me to Washington, and I had to live with people that I didn't know. They were nice. They made kind of a sun porch in, into a bedroom for me. But I felt like, I don't know what I felt, because I didn't know she died until I came back. And that's when post-traumatic syndrome, I know I had it. Because when I came back, my grandmother was gone. A desk that I loved, and with my little papers, I always had a lot of papers, a lot of things. I was doing drawings and things. All of that was gone, and we moved to um, to Knoxville shortly <laughs> after that. And uh, when I was in Knoxville, I saw Dolly Parton. Dolly Parton. Oh wow! Um, yeah. She was a little girl entertaining, a star already. And um, it's so funny, show business allows you, you know, that was so important to me. Um, Tennessee Williams was important. And both Dolly and Tennessee Williams I met later just because of show business lets you do that. So, yeah. 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 So, yeah. Do you I like it to doing too much talking and you may no, have to ask you a question. Mm -hmm. when you were with the Barter Theater. Mm -hmm. um, and you did the glass menagerie. Was it? Did you get to New York on tour, or did you just go to New York? No, I did tour there and around the Appalachian area. Mm -hmm. so you can imagine what the audiences were not, you know, terribly interested in a play by Tennessee Williams. Mm -hmm. But I remember everyone liked my limp. Yeah. <laughs> appreciated the fact I'd worked on my limp and yeah. had really seemed to have a very realistic limp. And yeah. I remember getting good reviews 
from someone in Knoxville, Malcolm Miller. He was just wonderful. And he really supported me and encouraged me to go to New York. But I didn't need any encouragement because I always wanted to go to New York because Howard and Warren had been in New York. And it just made them, they just seemed so wonderful to me. Yeah. Um, you, you, you moved to the Y. Uh-huh. Well, that's, $10 yeah. a week or $10 a month? No, $10 a week, which was hard to make, but still, it was really great. You got breakfast, and I, I had that room. The rule was you had to leave. You only got two or three weeks there, and then you had to leave and make room for another Southern girl, you know, to, to come and try to make it. And I, I met this wonderful woman downstairs. She was so good to me. and. When I was supposed to move, I said, well, I, I have to find an apartment I could afford. Well, all my years in New York, I never found an apartment I could afford. <laughs> <laughs> and that time, especially living at the Y. Um, she, she let me stay longer, but I had to get thrown out anyway because I cooked in my room, which I shouldn't have. Yes. Not only did I cook, but I actually asked people over. Okay. <laughs> in this little tiny room and... You had to shower outside in the hall. How did you? How, did, how were you supporting yourself? Yeah. It wasn't barely. I oh, it had money from the tour. Oh yeah. With barter, I'd saved up a little money, very little. But I knew skill set. I don't know what made me think I could make it. I was then trying to make it as an actress. You know, I had pictures and things like that, and um, I. Um, I remember going up for parts, never getting anything except a part that was a, like a Sunday morning show that was very religious. They, they had them on Sunday mornings. Yeah. And um, for some reason, it was called Lamp Unto My Feet. I have never yeah. understood that. I didn't understand the role. I don't know why I got cast in that. But when I saw myself, I realized I needed another skill set. <laughs> I had nothing to do with acting. So I um, always wanted to write, always felt I was, I was a writer. I had that sensibility. That's what, but I worried that everything had been said already, you know. And the um, thing that I'm jumping really far ahead now, but the thing that, um, that helped me was I wasn't nearly as fragile as lunch to law, but I, I did always depend on the kindness of strangers. Yeah. I, and I always got it. It's so funny, the people that helped me in so many ways, I would, uh, like the woman at the Y, yes. you know, that was going to let me stay. And uh, of course, as I say, I got kicked out because of, but she tried to help me. And so many times I had people that tried to help me. And eventually, that help <laughs> did support me, and I ended up with some, so, uh, an incredible kind of gay group that mm -hmm. at that time, I don't know how they were successful. There was Jane Trey who had the bank of um, a woman's bank that she was part of. Liz Smith, you know her, yes. and she died, died recently. But I just fell in with this group. And they were just fantastic. And they accepted me and I I felt like I was going to be okay, which I wasn't. I still didn't have anything that I really knew what to do. I would write parodies and things like that. I went to Ju Julius Monk and never was able to sell anything to him. I was with Kay Bauer for a while and she was a brilliant comedian. She never liked my stuff. Oh. No, she didn't. Oh. She was brilliant. I loved her. And um, for some reason, when I met Lily, Lily loved my work. And it meant so much to me because yeah. I really didn't have confidence, had no reason to be confident. And I'd written JT and was, was successful in that. That was remarkable that that happened. That had started out, out as a song, right, JT? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Song. Were you performing the song first? Not really very well, but it, it sounded <laughs> like it didn't. I went to 1650 Broadway, which was this 
place where you'd try to go and the sell. Building, the Brill Building, yeah. Yeah, that's right. That's yeah. right. That that was a terrible period. The Brill Building, I did not like. And they were, at that point, it was time of this Johnny James, a lot of Italian singers. And I had, you know, and I was doing kind of story songs, um, like JT. And so that didn't go. And I don't know what made me write that into a play. I don't know. Sometimes just out of the blue, something would strike me, you know, um, and I'd do it. I, had, I, I never had the drive, like when I met Lily, she had such an incredible strength and drive to go up and be rejected all the time, not, not all the time, but, you know, you have to have strength and courage and belief in yourself. I never had that. So after lamping to my feet, I never acted again. I never, <laughs> and I did the world a favor there. But I you think that and writing was writing was so much more of a part of your sensibility because you could be by yourself and dream. Mm -hmm. Exactly, exactly. You know that, and um, and you just you know you were more in control. Except when it came to having something that you you know had needed produced. That's where JT was remarkable because I got the Peabody, mm -hmm. and um, it gave me some confidence. But not really. When I got confidence, it was because of Lily, who believed in my work and the humor and all of that. Like, I wasn't even sure, like, Julius Monk never liked my stuff. And he was, you know, that was a wonderful upstairs at the downstairs. I'm not sure when you, you were in New York, whether you knew that. But um, the history of that place, because that's where um, Bernadette Peters and... Exactly, John Rivers, some group of people. people got yeah. But I want to ask you this question. Do you, when you say Lily understood your work, mm -hmm. um, do you feel, well, first of all, let me, because we love a love story. How did you feel when you met Lily? Had you seen her perform before? She had done a few weeks at the bitter end when she met me. I was very flattered to know she put on a special show so I could see her. Oh, wonderful. We had a similar sense. We loved uh, Oh, Dad, Poor Dad. We loved... Um, Mad <laughs> yeah, right. And Mad Moon and Child. Lily had played, I guess her name was Irene, the maid. And oh, I, we loved no. similar things. And, and it was just kind of remarkable that we had... We were on the same page aesthetically in so many ways, mm -hmm. and um, her appreciation of my work meant all the work difference to me uh, in terms of before it's like I was mo motivated mostly to procrastinate. I didn't have much motivation at all. I saw her motivation. I saw her drive. I saw her get up, go to audition for something that she didn't even know, you know, come back and not get it. And just the strength that she showed just yes. taught me something. And uh, not that I ever did that again. As I said, I never went for an acting part again. And um, although I don't think lamp up to my feet was my fault, I don't think, <laughs> <laughs> I don't think it was that crazy. Oh, you know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I want to ask, what it, was it like to, to write for someone who could embody your ideas and language, that must have been unbelievable. You know, yeah. Relation to you, because that's that's what writers always dream of, right? Is that the no. language inhabits somebody else. I know. And um, it was like when she asked me to write for Edith then she was already, she had already gotten a, a Grammy for Ernestine. That was her brilliant creation that was such a hit, a laugh in. I had nothing to do with that, and and uh, but Edith Ann intrigued me because she wanted some kind of depth that she perceived that I, you know, that I might add, and that was uh, just that was almost like an ecstatic time when we both just found you know each other aesthetically and in every other way. What was, what was it like to move from? the scripts to, direct, to doing direction and script writing. What was the, 
was it was directing did it feel as natural to you as the writing no because you know you have to have more authority than i naturally have or you have to be I, i'm so introverted you know you actually have to deal with people in another way it was one thing dealing with lily but i felt um like I knew it so well, I knew what to do, and I, we did appearing nightly first, and um, I felt like I knew what to do to support Lily. Yes. The fact that she was very nurturing and very uh, open to, to accepting my ideas, it was just a remarkable gift, time, yeah. you know. And then I started, uh, making money from being a designer. I did something called Teach Me, Read Me sheets for, mm. uh, for Kimberly Clark. And I never was satisfied with, uh, with the design thing because it seemed superficial to me. Mm. And it was, I guess, except there was a good concept, you know. But that, so I started making a living, you know, as a creative consultant, like Trudy says. Oh. I really borrowed that, you know. I didn't know. I didn't know that because it was um, because you're so private and your career is so rich that I, I could spend. Well, I have asked you to spend weeks with you, to, <laughs> but to, given that given that time limit um, for us, I want to know what it was what it was like for a woman creator out in um, in the quote unquote, the industry in the 70s and 80s, do you think that it was a, mm -hmm. a more difficult time than it is now? In some ways, because there was not the group of people who, was, who were criticizing it or movements that were criticizing it, it was just more accepted. And 1650 Broadway was a really not a good time for me. Yeah. So, um, I never thought of it as sexual harassment, it was just not a good time. Um, that time, and they would always say, well, "You need demos." And I didn't even have a piano at that point. And I played the piano by ear, but not enough that I thought I could make a great, great demo. Mm -hmm. But um, I'm going off a little bit. From, um, I started writing a lot of music anyway, and I met Carolyn Hester, who was kind of a established folk songs she liked singer she liked my stuff and she made some some um not records that were published but demos you know and as a matter of fact i don't know why i brought it up because none of the records or nothing songs ever became but she again gave me some confidence mm -hmm. but with lily i just lost them in a way it was really because she was there she was encouraging and uh, it was like, I wish every writer could have that. You know, it's what we all want and yearn for, acceptance, appreciation. Yes. I want to ask you something about the, um, your writing method. So when we read a script of yours, uh, one of my favorite film, unproduced um, film scripts was... Um, that you wrote based on the novel. Um, is it not oh, what was it? I'm, I'm sorry, I interrupted you. Yeah. Okay. Yes. What did Lily say? What did someone say? Maiden, Maiden I think. Yeah. No. Yeah. Oh, that's right. I remember you asked to show, see those yeah. things, and you read that. Yeah. Scripts that now, you know, 40 years later, people could catch up with what you were trying to do. And so I wondered about your writing methods. Do you, I'm not, myself, I'm not a chronological writer. I'll, I'll mm -hmm. write parts and then put them together as I see them coalescing. Mm -hmm. Do you write from beginning to end when you write a monologue or are you writing bits first and then putting it together? You know, when you say method or system, I didn't have, I just did what I did kind of, you know, just full on. If I was motivated, I could get inspired. My problem, as I say, uh, I was basically motivated to procrastinate and put off and that sort of thing. And when I realized I could actually, Lily was there 
actually a person who would be able to take my material and use it. And that was fantastic. And I learned from that. Um, a same kind of method in a way that where books fall open, that kind of stuff. You know, I just would take a chance and I don't remember um, creating a system, mm -hmm. I, you know, even where I could really organize my papers. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, where it's sort of like, it has to, for it to have value for you, it has to stay in a dream state almost in a way that you have to keep mm -hmm. and Lily, is part of the dream, you know, she can make it. And she was always saying, give me material, give me material. Yes, and there's, there's nothing more flattering to a writer. No. Um, I wanted to ask you something about um, working with other people. Mm -hmm. A lot of the early works um, that I love so much, like Lily for President and Lily sold out and... <laughs> Love those specials. We had the greatest time. Specials. I wanted to know what it was like for you to be in a room with other writers trying to get material that worked for Lily because it was such an intimate exchange between you two. Yeah, I didn't like it at all. It's not my nature, you know. To what I always marveled at brilliant comedians who did that, who sat around and they would give and take. I always wanted to go home and do, you know, something alone. I met so many different people during that time, and I became a producer in a way, and without Lily and everything like that, and, and it was a real growth experience for me, because yeah. I, like what you were saying about being a director, it was not a natural thing, but I pulled it off, you know, and it was really big. And so building confidence, I think that every writer will relate to this, is a really, very often writers, more than not, are introverted and a little shy, and I think I was, I know I was like that too. And so confidence is a thing you need. And how do you get confidence when you're so shy, you never sell anything or show anyone anything? So I had that problem. I don't know whether you did. I did too, but I, I think that we, the way that you have had Lily, I had my mother. And oh, your mother. You got to write more about her. She was just the woman of very few words, but they were so encouraging. Yeah, yeah. When you work on longer pieces like Appearing Nightly and The Search, is it because you want to tell a, a, a bigger story or sort of build a house for Lily? My God, to have Lily, you know, to write for too was, was like a dream, like you said. What are, what are, what are the methods? Um, I'm going to ask you this again because it's, it's such a funny question, but when Lily says, you know, write for me, give me stuff, um, you started with Ernestine, and... Um, uh, no, Ernestine really was established I, on Latin. You then you're saying, right. All right, pardon me. Um, is it, what does it feel like when you're in the room and you give an artist two pages and they start to embody it? What does that feel like for you? Well, fear often because of Kay didn't like my stuff. <laughs> Jew, Jewish monk, I read. I wrote a good piece for Julius upstairs, downstairs. Um, this was a time of Robert Moses in New York and HUD problems with people, um, homeless people not being able to live and all. And so, uh, the Robert Moses was just going on like there was no problem, <laughs> and. Um, he was one of the great builders of that time. And I, I just remember uh, thinking there was something wrong with that. And so I wrote a piece that I'm still proud of. It's called Edifice Rex, W-R-E-C-K-S. And I thought I just would just go in and Julius Monk would open up the world for me. This was before I met Lily. And he, he didn't seem to react at all. So I had a history of giving my work to certain people and they're not reacting at all. But you're talking again about something that's very personal and beautiful, which is confidence and how do you find that? Mm -hmm. If it's not a novel or something that you're doing, it depends on another person enacting mm -hmm. um, your work. And so Lily gave you that confidence. Do you, do you feel 
um, that that was the confidence that you took into producing and directing somewhat? Yeah, or? yeah. and um, it made all the difference that I trusted Lily, you know, and I knew that she liked my material. Um, there were times when I knew that I would open up material to people that weren't responsive, and that was a horrible experience and filled with fear, you know. I still have a fear of rejection. I still would rather not do a project than have to go up and pitch it, you know, <laughs> because you ha don't have, I, I hardly ever have it worked out into a pitch. I saw Joel Silver one time, uh, Universal, he pitched, um, I forget what he pitched. Xanadu. Xanadu, Xanadu, if you can imagine. And he pitched it so great that if I had the money, I would have invested in it and supported it. And it, he just did it off the top of his head. It's a gift, you know? I never had that gift. What is it, Jane, when you, when you think about, um, do you feel that you've accomplished things or do you still feel very insecure? Oh, I, yeah, I, I feel like insecure. I still would love to accomplish more. And I still feel, I don't understand why I wasn't more prolific looking back because I had the opportunity to be, but it was just, the fear of having it fail, even after you've done something good, you get that confidence in that. But that's confidence that you have in that piece. <laughs> you don't have confidence. You start almost new again. When you're doing a new piece, you don't have confidence that it's going to turn out that way. So I had, a lot of, I had negative tapes like that. I think a lot of writers do. Yeah. You just have to overcome it. You're um, bringing Toni Morrison to the search when it was on Broadway. Oh. And um, right. I how you were so, I, you, were, you, you just kind of wanted to disappear. You were so shy. I was so overwhelmed with her. I love her so much. And yeah. I couldn't believe you did that. That was so. Were, when we sat in the audience, um, when, you, when Lily was doing um, Dracula, um, Lud and Marie, mm -hmm. at one point, um, Marie said, Lud says, come here, Tits, and, and and, Lud, and Marie says, quit. And I remember Tony turning to me and she said, I had completely forgotten that, quit. You know? <laughs> <laughs> oh, that, that's great to know that. I, you know, uh, one time you asked me if, um, if all writing is political. Yes. And you think, like, what is that character, Tony Morrison's book, The Bluest Eye, Piccoli, Pic Piccoli, Piccoli? Piccola. Yeah. Piccola. Yeah. And I think absolutely she's proof that it's all political because she had no self-esteem. Where did her lack of self-esteem come from? Why did she want blue eyes? You know, that's political. That's right. You either, you either are societal pressures are so major and, and you're either um, at their mercy or you're being kind of congratulated or being supported by them, one or the other. And um, so I, I think in answer to your question, I think absolutely when you dig deep enough, if the writer's deep enough, if you know where they're from and all that, when you, when you know where somebody's from, it's political. That's right. I wanted, I wanted to ask you about, since we're on the subject, there have been a lot of upheavals. Um, and you said something so brilliant um, the other day. Um, you said that, um, Evolution was trending. Yeah, I do. <laughs> That's, I wrote it down immediately. Oh, um, I really feel that something major is happening. I yeah. really can't believe it. I'm sort of stunned by it. In the middle of all this awfulness, yeah. this uh, white supremacy that's coming up, all of that, you have something, I guess it's, it's one of the things that does happen that causes a revolution or evolution. I feel like something is happening that, you know, the search was really about in consciousness rather than intelligence, both really, I guess. But consciousness um, is something we still haven't even gotten into. And yet the people in the streets, it's about consciousness. Yes. So many different levels. And so I can't believe that this won't result in something very, very profound, very important, in a good way. And you're, to me, because of your 
power as an artist. You are so much a part of that in my life. Oh, thank you. My evolution and, and consciousness. Should we bring somebody out who, who knows a little bit, who knows you kind of well? Who's also done the marching, which I haven't done. Jane and Lily <laughs> do the marching about consciousness. And I, hello, a, hello. A, I think you've been asked to join us. Yes, hi, I'm here, I'm here. I put a woman named Lily Tomlin, um, who um, is, is, is the other core part of my heart. Mm -hmm. um, in terms of inspiration and and belief. And Lily, I want to, because Jane is too shy to answer these questions, I want to know how you felt about Jane when you first met her. Well, a friend brought her to my hotel room, and I, I tell you, in, in two minutes, I fell in love with her. Wow. It was just so inevitable. Yeah. Uh, the great hotel. First of all, she had on... Hot pants. Oh. She had on navy blue I short that description blue hot so pants. Bad. I don't and she had on, called, uh, I, I was the same clothes, so I think it's <laughs> <laughs> that's always her excuse. They, and she had on stretchy boots that went up to the knee, and she had a little backpack. And it was just, uh, and she was just, I don't know what it was. I she didn't. It wasn't. Well, it certainly wasn't, wasn't that outfit. You it described. wasn't your clothes that impressed me so much. <laughs> well, then why do you tell that? Oh, every place. Well, they did. Well, room. they did have some effect. But um, I just, uh, I just fell in love with her, yeah. and I immediately. And I didn't fly in those days because I was. Uh, I lost so many friends to drug overdoses and all <laughs> kinds of things. And so I was taking the I had to take the next morning the train back to uh, Chicago to play a date. Mm -hmm. And as soon as I hit Chicago, I got on another plane and flew back to New York because I had a day off. That day I was there, I had that, that day off, and I didn't have to be back until the next night to do the show. Yeah. So I called Jane immediately, and I said, Look, I don't have much time, but I have to see you. <laughs> and uh, she agreed to to see me, and we had a little date. <clears throat> and I, um, and then I went back to Chicago, and I was. Flying. And then I tried to get her. I, yeah, I did all that flying, and then I, <clears throat> I had her. I tried to convince her to come out to California to visit me, and uh, <clears throat> she didn't. Wasn't terribly interested. Oh. I, she acted like she wasn't anyway. But I didn't like to fly either, but. <laughs> <laughs> well, she, and so eventually she came out and I, I got her. Oh, so then I saw JT. Yep. Well, that just gobsmacked me. I yep. went, <clears throat> I was totally smitten when I saw JT. And I tried to get her to come out. I had to do my Edith Ann album. And I persuaded her to come out and help me with it. Yes. And so that was it. Wow. And what is it like, Lily, when, when Jane gives you a piece of writing? It just hits your soul immediately, always? In terms of trying yeah. to figure it out. Well, that. yeah, I, 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 I so it's, it's like I just thought of something. She is talking about an old script that someone sent me like 10 years ago. And I called my agent today and I said, whatever happened with that old script, blah, blah, blah. Because when Jane likes something, I have to give it special attention. Yes. And uh, so when, when she would give me a piece of material, I, first of all, I, I'm, she used to say, I have to uh, uh, work, I have to attack the empty page. And I say, well, I have to attack the full page. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so I a lot of times I'm a little nervous. I look at it and I think, oh, God, do I understand this? Can I get this? Can I put this on its feet? Can I know what to do with this? Yes. And um, so that's, but usually it's so right on I or so clear, I get it right away. Sometimes I don't. I mean, I have to talk about it and exchange it with her and all that stuff, but that's not very often. I, I usually, especially if we're working on something, I know what she intends. In fact, I always know what she intends. Yeah. She expresses how I feel, yes. which I have no ability to do. But she can express in words what I feel about the world, about humans, about 
the struggle that we're in, the uh, presumably not the inevitability of it all, but um, something that me that I know speaks to other people. Yes. So then I moved to um, well, I moved to do it at all times, but I I uh, I sometimes have to work a little harder. Yes. I was I was wondering about certain things that I know were very big struggles for you guys early on in terms of um, the politics of TV and oh yeah, for instance, Juke and Opal, which is a completely cl mm -hmm. complete classic, and I know that there was a lot of interference from as they call them the suits in those days. <laughs> well, well I, yeah, go ahead. And I was well, even even when when um, I didn't I hope I didn't interrupt you when Richard Pryor was a guest I think on another special he was on our first special yeah. and, and you second. kissed he had cornrows and he was and he was always challenging people and everything and so the suits you know were kind of already contentious a little bit and when you two kissed each other didn't they cut that or they somebody no, no, I don't think they did I don't remember. Uh, I mean, they they did a lot of bogus stuff. They sent down, you know, at the uh, at the end of the like night. I have a cast, and yeah. I have all my guests, and I'm going to kiss them good night. Mm -hmm. And they sent down word. They said, "Don't kiss Richard oh, good night." Yeah. I couldn't think of anything more stupid. Kiss on film, and it's one of my favorite things to look at because when Lily kisses Richard, he just falls out on the. <laughs> I think, frankly, uh, Richard had a crush on Lily. Oh, he had a big crush on her. He said, yeah. he said he just wanted to be with Lily in all her different characters. <laughs> <laughs> oh, did he? Oh, God. Oh, God. He was, oh, he, when I first saw him, he was doing uh, The Prince and the Princess. Yeah. <laughs> and Sullivan, you know, which was totally mm -hmm. acceptable and everything. But I, still, I saw to his heart. It's one of my favorite things that we worked with Richard. Yeah. You know? No, he was, he was and, totally And your, your writing about Juke and Opal meant so much, and I appreciate oh, it. Listen, I could do, it's just, you guys have done so much. Did you did you know that uh, Obama when when she oh got, when I got yeah, the Kennedy Center on mentioned her, that piece yeah. he said he quoted you he said mm -hmm. uh, that you know he now said that it was the most profound uh, what did you say most profound uh, something <laughs> example yeah of, of, or, or based on race and class that you've ever seen on network television. I wanted to find that, but I don't think that. that I tried to. Place. I tried to find it. We didn't have. That. Okay, now that he's not, he's less busy. We can have some facts. <laughs> <of him. laughs> oh my God! Now, okay. when I, I have a, I have a final question for you. Um, Lily does lots of projects, you know, not your shows, and mm -hmm. and but is Lily is, uh, is Jane part of everything that you do, Lily? Yeah. Well, I always have her. I like her to read a script. Absolutely. You know, even if we're on weekly episodic television where there's not much time to change anything or fix anything, I uh, I always want her to read it and tell me if if I've overlooked something that I didn't see on the on the first go round. Uh, absolutely. And then sometimes she gives me a a good twist to a line, or especially in movies where you have more time. Mm -hmm. um, she always, she's always given me great lines in movies that I've done, yes. and I always manage to get them in. <laughs> <laughs> Hardly ever. Oh, I do. <laughs> I certainly do. I haven't done a movie in a while. I did Grandma, but uh, well, you know, you gotta, you gotta, I just saw it. they they have a, they had a, a an article on the internet about uh, insurance for older you know actors and. They use me and Jane Fonda as, as the lead picture. <laughs> that was good. Mm. About well, getting insurance for a production. Yes. It's mm. that for each, in, in, in being each other's consciousness, mm -hmm. um, that for me and for so many other people, and that's why Jane gives us these words, as you said, she tells us how we feel. Yeah. Extraordinary gift, Jane. 
that you've given me since I was 10 years old and I saw oh. Disney. I've been talking to you and Lily ever since. Mm -hmm. I, said, I just have to make them my gay family. I'm going to do it. And I used to just, oh. because, because of how much love you give us, we mm -hmm. want to be there. So I love you both dearly. And we love you, Elton. I, I love this award. <laughs> I'm having a good time. <laughs> and, uh, so I'll Where's talk this about award? We should show it. Yeah, there it Can is. It? There it is. Oh my God! In the shape of a book. Yes. Certainly yeah. is. Yes. I love this. That's so nice. God, thank you, Jane. Thank you, Lily. Thank you, Hilton. Thank you for sharing your brilliance with us today. I'm so moved and inspired by all of you um, for your enormous contributions to American culture. We are so grateful. We appreciate how each of you has brought your full, authentic selves to all that you do. Your work is a testament to the power and range of LGBTQ art and identity. Um, I just want to take a moment and say um, a few words about Lambda Literary. For 30 years, Lambda Literary has fought for the belief that our literature, LGBTQ literature, is fundamental to the preservation of our community and that their life is affirmed when our stories are written, published, and read. Um, Lambda Literary is the nation's de facto home for LGBTQ writers, in addition to celebrating luminaries like Jane, who serves thousands of LGBTQ writers and book lovers every year through a range of programs. Mm -hmm. Serves book lovers of all ages. Since 1989, we have celebrated the best in LGBTQ books through the Lambda Literary Awards. Uh, we also bring our books into classrooms so that kids, especially queer and trans youth, can see themselves reflected in the books they read at school. We prepare future generations of queer writers by offering the only writing residency in the world exclusively, exclusively for emerging LGBTQ writers. And our work is only possible through the generous support of people like you who are watching in your homes. We're so glad that you joined us. Um, and it's why I'm asking that you make a donation to Lambda Literary tonight. Um, in lieu of having our Lambda Literary Awards um, in person, we've been having readings and we've been so lucky to have this beautiful program tonight with to honor Jane and uh, with Hilton and, and Lily among us. Um, if you are able to um, uh, make a donation of any size, our website is lambdaliterary.org and there's a donate button. Um, we'd love to continue to bring programs like tonight's in the months and years ahead. Um, we plan to do so and um, I just want to turn back and say, Jane, congratulations. Thank you for being uh, the incredible, wonderful writer and inspiration to all of us. And thank you, Lily, um, for being here with us and, um, and Hilton for hosting this just such a powerful event. We love you and thank you. Thank, thank you. you. I'm very touched. Right. You can play hooky from school, but you can't play hooky from yourself. I don't understand nothing. What you got to understand, child, is yourself. Hi. Where 
wrote you something. I hope you like it. Man, you sure must be hungry. Sixty-five. What? Forty-one sixty-five. Nothing. Uh-oh. Seems like there's been some kind of mix-up. I never purchased no tuna fish. Would I cheat you? No, but I didn't buy any. I'll tell you the truth. I was wondering myself why all of a sudden so much tuna fish. But your boy's been buying it like it was going out of style. You sure he's my boy? The little boy with the radio in his head. He's yours, isn't he? Well, <laughs> there is no mistake. Last week he was in here three times. Seems like every time I get a nickel's worth of difference between me and my bills, that boy does something to set me back. This sums up to be a little more than I planned. Could I give you 25 now? And Don't worry. From now on, uh, please don't sell him anything on credit. Unless it's written down on paper as my list. You should have seen Buster. I dressed him up. He looked good. I took Mama's clip-on earrings and I put them on his ears. <laughs> and then I pasted blue stars on his fur. And I took my baby brother's booties and put them on his feet. And Mama said, why are these babies' booties so dirty? <laughs> and you know what I told her? I said, that little baby boy gets up and walks when we don't see him. <laughs> Wasn't that good? <laughs> Buster! Buster, I dressed up in my mama's high heels and I walked in the mud in the empty lot and I got stuck. <laughs> I got out, but the shoes didn't. <laughs> mama was very angry. You know what happens when you get angry, lady? Uh, no, no, what happens? First, your face gets just like a fist. And then, your heart gets like a bunch of bees that flies up and stings your brain in the front. And then, your two eyes is like dark clouds looking for trouble. And your blood is like a tornado. And then you have bad weather inside your body. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you. 
Table, so that there isn't so much water around. Don't pay the rent for no. my escape. <laughs> we're going to do a cold lobster with a very lovely sauce. Mm -hmm. I mean, I've been so worried about you. Where you been? I ain't seen you for a week, baby. I've been down the job training place, doing my job, working my fingers to the bone, and I'm fed up with them people. Favorite kind. You hungry? Yeah, I'm starved. Got okay? some waffles and gravy. You better have you something nourishing. Give me a bowl of soup. I ought to give you a bowl of methadone. That's what I ought to do. Oh, that's what I'm strung out on now, that methadone. Hand me that jive about job training. You trained all right. You're highly skilled at not working. You're a jive, Turkey. I, I am a worker. It's not because I don't want to work. Just because there's nothing worthwhile working for. You got a good touch. Do I feel cold? It's cold, baby. Here, that's homemade potato soup. It needs salt. No, it needs some potatoes. Where's the potatoes? <laughs> I don't like pepper on my stuff. And what's this? Give me some bread, some butter. Some crackers irritate the line in my mouth. She yeah. a clean knife. You irritate the line in my mind. <laughs> thank you, thank you. No, I really tried though. I was down there for about three weeks at that place, working, I had on a suit, tie, shaving, acting crazy, look just like a fool in a circus. And I'm fed up with it. Oh yeah. Now I know how to do a job don't need to be done no more. For real? Don't they ever make bread that don't tear it? You know, I always did suspect those training programs was mainly to provide jobs for the people doing the training. That burns me up, baby. Hi, Opal. What's that? How you doing? Oh. Hey, Juke. Uh, Jimmy. We only put the homemade pies over. On the shelf where it says homemade pies. Oh. <laughs> what did you do, Shane? Had a suit last week. Oh, no, I wish I'd seen that. You didn't get fired for giving me a ride in that truck? No. You want some lunch? I don't know. What do you got? Boy, it's cold outside. No potato soup, please. I ain't caught a potato yet. <laughs> hey, what's this? R&B? What's that? Rice and beans. No, I don't. I don't. Oh, oh, that's my thing. I can be doing some hard beef. Yeah. Oh. Give me a dime, baby, for the box. You know how to pay the box without the coin? You told me not to do that when people was here. <laughs> <laughs> you got any milk that doesn't have any these little things floating in it? What you mean? Let me... Well, now somebody put the buttermilk in the wrong container by accident. Hey, come on, Jimmy, get out. Yeah. I love to see you dance, baby. Come on, come on. Come on, Mama. Don't you look good? Oh, come on, let's see you dance. Sing it, Mr. Jimmy. It's all right. Lud, who was it said? Uh, do you, what was it? They, do you remember what they said, Lud? You hear yourself, Marie? What you just said? Well, I guess so. I just said it. You know what this piece should be about? It should never. You should never talk about anything. Uh -huh. just, just things like that. And <laughs> and oh, and then he says, uh, "You have a brain like a hummingbird, Marie. Did you ever see a hummingbird try to make up its mind which flower to land on?" Think of your brain in place of that hummingbird, and you got a good idea of your mental condition or something like you that. You got a good idea of what I have to deal with every day. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's so dear. That's all. So, I mean, so Jane had written that piece a long time ago, and so, um, and then when we got the idea to make Agnes their granddaughter, then she wrote that other piece. She had put Agnes into it. <laughs> And one very special person, Jane Wagner, whose brilliant talent has contributed more to what I've done than any other person I know, and with whom I share this honor totally, she never did intend to come. <laughs> because she knows, as I know, that there's more to life than this. This piece is about my mother and father. <laughs> I've changed the names to protect them. <laughs> we need a sound effect. We need a door slam. It's more than sufficient. It's after supper. Ludd and Marie are sitting in the living room. Marie is cutting recipes from a magazine and pasting them to three by five cards. Ludd is reading the newspaper. 
and eating a piece of cake. They sit a long time in silence. The front door opens. Is that you? No, it's Dracula's daughter. <laughs> How's the cake blood? Oh, like always, I guess. Couldn't be like always. I never got this kind of cake before. Hmm. I thought something was different. <laughs> I was going to get that banana kind, but you always pick the icing off. So I got this plain kind of cake because it didn't have any icing. No icing, huh? I thought something was missing. How come you never get that chocolate kind of cake anymore? Because the last time I got it, Lud, you broke out into a rash. I did. I don't remember that. When did I get that rash? Tuesday. And when did I eat that cake? Monday. Hmm. Must have been the cake then. Well, that's what I thought. That's why I got this plain kind of cake. It's not so rich. Yeah, it's not so rich. It's not so good either. <laughs> Well, I thought this plain kind of cake wouldn't be fattening. Yeah, it's not fattening, because it's not as good as a rich kind, so you don't eat as much. <laughs> well, maybe that's why you broke out into a rash, Lud. You eat too much of that other kind of cake because you like it too much. Police, stop talking about that cake! <laughs> I love you, Pat. I'm sorry. I just don't see how selling a cute little doll could hurt anything. A cute little doll? Vance, do you, do you think we need another cute little doll in the world? I mean, really? Do you think we need another glue or a perfume or a detergent that, that eats away dirt along with your life? I mean, you tell me. Come on, kids. Pat... When you're ready to come down off that soapbox, g give me a call. Bye, Mom. Bye, Mom. <laughs> Honey, wait, Vance. Honey, wait. Wait, don't leave. Vance, I love you. Wait a second. Wait a second, Vance. W wait, don't. Kids, wait a second. I need you. For I love you all. Please, Vance. <laughs> ah! 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 Way for the brand new waivers, Agnes Angst and the Manic Depressives doing their never to be released National Tantrum. We're down to our last dollar bill, our drug is hungry, fill our doctor said what's made us ill is not expressing what we feel. He said, I see hostility is what you're all about. So take your rage upon the stage and let your anger out. I'm angry at machines that think they're so damn smart. I'm angry at pop culture and I'm angry at art. I'm angry at Plato and I'm angry at Sartre. I think they're poor, I am, and so I'm angry at Descartes. I'm angry at the waiters who won't give me a table. I'm angry at the networks and I'm angry. I'm angry at cable, I'm angry at sitcoms, I'm fed up with sports. I'm mad at the criminals, I'm mad at the courts. Let your anger out, let your anger out, let your anger out, let your anger out. Angry at the designers who what they make us wear. Angry at the dog face who did this to my hair. 
here I am, out here on the cutting edge of quantum uncertainty, grappling with the imponderables. May I have the envelope, please, so I can push it? If it weren't for false hopes, the economy would just collapse again. This is soup. This is art. Art soup. Soup art. Did you hear what you just said, Marie? The trick is not to mind it. Whoa! I guess these characters, in a way, could be called iconic. You have the crazy, you have the teenager, the grandparents, average Americans. That's the other law of physics, too, the interconnectedness of people and the fact that we um, all share the same atoms, whether we like it or not. I just knew that that concept would embrace a lot of different characters and a lot of different things could be modular. You could take a character out, you could move it around, and I just knew that that was a, a good umbrella for a really good concept, and then, then it evolved from, from that concept. I must be getting bodybuilding burnout, Ted. Lately, I've been thinking, what's the point? A lot. What's the point? Being a, a health nut by day, if you're a cokehead at night. Even sports. I still watch the games, but I don't root so much anymore. It's the same with sex. My sex surge is still industrial strength. But Ted, where's the desire? Ugh. What's the point being a hedonist if you're not having a good time? I blame a lot of what I'm going through on the divorce. My whole life fell apart. This one day I'm in the den, waiting for the game to start. I see this magazine quiz Penny had filled out on a scale of one to ten. How do you rate your man as a dresser, a dancer, a lover, a conversationalist? Uh, uh, uh. Ted, she rated me so low. Hell, who knows what's considered a good lover these days anyway? Every time you turn around, there's an orogenous zone you gotta go explore. Vaginal, clitoris, X max, the G spot, nape of the neck, the wrist, the back of the knee. Hell, these days a guy needs his dick hooked up to a laptop computer. <sighs> ah. ah, I miss the disco days, man. I bet I feel about disco the way hippies must feel about Woodstock. I will show you my kid. Polaroid. Nurse took it, the moment of my son's birth. <laughs> now I, I could jump all over it. That's okay. Yeah, because it comes to you, not your end. Thanks for the show. Good show. Lynn is like, has the, has, is taking that idealistic stance. You know, she's saying, I feel such a rush of positive woman energy. Um, so you must have that to make the ending work. Oh, I understand. I understand, but I was going to have people say, like, you know, like, you never, like Marjorie said, you never get a bunch of women to work together or yeah, something like that, that, see. And Edie's saying, uh, I think there should only be women and we don't need any men. You see your attitude right there? That's perfect for both types. We you, don't, have, you have somebody very intense who has no humor. Yeah, <laughs> that's know, what I, which is, you know, Marge what saying. is there because it's something to do at night and she's with, you know, really. No, Marge is very superficial about it. I yeah, so I don't know how, really, and, and, and Lynn is really a conciliatory, idealistic. You want, one person is, is in earnest and you're the main character. But God forbid that the peace seems that way. You know what I mean? That's, well, that's I think it's the thing. Well, that, I think it's I seems hope so. humorous. I mean, no, I think they're just smiler. Oh, I don't I think so. they think like, you know. Well, and that's why I wanted one of the marching bands and all that right away. All those little steps that, you know, you're acting like it's a big thing, and then right away you make fun of those yeah. things that your women are allowed into marching bands. You know? right, right. And that has to come real quick. So we know the tone is more satiric. I worry about MTV changing our way of not thinking. People have created blocks not because they can't think of what to do in the future or they can't think of their next work, but that they've read their last work. I still have this urge to be moralist and want things to mean something. You know? But you know, it is. You know, when you do something like playing hooky like you did this morning, 
you're saying something, and it's more than just you don't like multiplication. You know what I'm saying? You will have to be born to run. Do you mean、uh, no one cares? I'm mad, and and I hate everybody. I mean, is that what you're saying? You know, what's the use? Or or God, nobody loves me. Yes, I have felt that love before, but I never had proof till today. Proof? Proof? Like nobody at home remembers it's your birthday. But why skip school? I mean, a lot of the kids might have remembered your birthday. Remember that time I told you that I was gonna break up with my old friends and get all new ones? Well, I did. I broke up with a whole grabbing, geeky, bug-like bunch. I thought by now I'd have new friends, but it's hard to find refills. Has this ever happened to you? You throw away your old pair of shoes 'cause you're sick of looking at 'em every day, and then you wish you still had 'em. Cause there was something about them that fit right, and nothing else feels quite as good. Hey, what do you think it is? Clearly, it's a、uh, it's, it's an old pair of shoes. An old pair of shoes. What kind of nut am I, Edith? Remember that first day? I said that our work would be like doing a puzzle, and I'd help you put it together. But you were gonna have to give me some pieces to work with. Well, I need a couple more pieces, Edith. Ah,、uh, boy! I didn't think we'd get past security out there. Yeah, I know. Now we just have to get past all our insecurities up here. Okay. <laughs> Hello, I'm Meryl Street, and I'm Lily Tomlin. And and, and tonight we are no, no, no. pleased to honor wait a, minute, a, wait a, minute. a man. No, we're honoring a man. A man who we honor. That's what a man who didn't. That's my reading my line. A man who didn't play by the rules. Yeah, that's what I said. Who didn't play by the rules or stick to the stick script? Stick to the script. I am.、Meryl. No, I'm agreeing with you. I'm agreeing with you. I'm just saying that Robert Altman didn't stick to the script. He colors outside the lines, and he wants actors to do the same thing. Yeah, I, I he doesn't want、know. us to act. No, and no. I'm grateful for that. He、uh, he he wants the kind of spontaneity that can only come from、yeah. not knowing what the hell you're doing. Like, like now, like、right? now, right?、Yeah. Yes. He, he just starts to film, and we watch the dailies and. And at some magical point, film just starts to wake up to him to itself. That's yeah, what, and you see, you and you, see, you say, "Oh, I see, I see, something's happening." Yeah, but usually you don't know what it is. <laughs> no, but but Altman does because well, otherwise it wouldn't、so. be happening. And his movie making style just does seem to enhance our capacity to take in more sounds and more, more images than、layered. we ever knew we had the process, the ability to process. You know, because the movies just seem to have a different metabolism than other movies. It, 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 he, well, he's always been ahead of the curve. He, he just, he, he just kind of, and he's able to capture the curve on layered, film with floating cameras, extended zooms. Just, Incredibly living, almost like they came from a parallel universe. And、um, well, to some moviegoers, it seems as if the popcorn they'd just、yeah. been munching had suddenly turned into peyote buttons. <laughs> oh! If I had known this is what it would be like to have it, I might have willing to settle for less. No. So this whole part has to be moved in. Bob, do you ever have doubt? Now you say this could come earlier. <laughs> <laughs> Good. See, and then that wouldn't have to be moved. She she tells all this great story about Robert and McCord, and then she says, "Do you have trouble telling the twins apart?" Well, don't I have a note? This should come earlier. Yes, that's what I meant by this should come earlier. Did you know that in 1976 the Supreme Court ruled that geneticists could patent new life forms? I worry by now, surely. Some of those life forms are old enough to leave the lab to strike out on their own, <laughs> and I worry some of them may be you. <laughs> so before I get started, I'd like to take a quick audience survey, just so I know exactly with whom I'm dealing. How many feel that your parents never really understood you? And, and how many feel it would have been more awkward if they had? <laughs> When I was a kid, my mother told me so many things that later turned out not to be true. She told me, "Whatever makes you happy will make me happy." <laughs> and she told me, "The people in Washington wouldn't be there if they didn't know what they were doing." <laughs> I worry about Washington. At at some point recently, 
I, I decided that idealism was unrealistic. <laughs> and I, I realized too that cynicism was equally foolish. Besides these days, no matter how cynical you become, it's never enough to keep up. <laughs> Uh, can you believe there was a time we actually felt secure when something was labeled government inspected? <laughs> can you believe you can actually buy something at the market called fat-free half and half? <laughs> and reality shows, before anybody else gets a reality show, they should have to prove at some point in their lives they've actually been in touch with reality. <laughs> oh, and the scientists, they finally found that black hole at the center of the galaxy. You know, that dark matter that, that sucks in everything, including time and light. They can't decide whether to call it Facebook or Twitter. <laughs> Oh, and Twitter. Speaking of Twitter, have we finally learned, thanks to our president, that something stops being trendy and qualifies as a disorder? <laughs> oh. Here's a bit of good advice for everyone, really. It, never leave the house drunk. <laughs> and if you're already out, you've got to learn to know when you've had too much to drink. I listen to my friends when they stop talking to me and start talking about me, saying, saying things like, did she have a purse? <laughs> and I worry about identity theft and why no one has chosen to be me. I worry that drugs have forced some of us to be more creative than we really are. Uh, finally, thank those people on whose shoulders you stand. My partner, writer Jane Wagner, is the one on whose shoulders I stand the tallest. I think of us in space, out of space. I feel so much for the whole human race. I think of the people I knew who cared for me. I think of the few who are still really there for me. I 